Well, welcome to Living Hope Church. We're so thankful you joined us this morning. Um, if you have children in kindergarten to third grade that are going down to Children's Church, they can dismiss out the back with Miss Alex and Miss Beth. Um, if you have children that are staying with us and uh, would uh, like, there's activities on the back table that they're more than welcome to, and there's a sermon notes that goes along uh, with the sermon designed for them that they are free to grab. Uh, well, this morning, uh, today, we are beginning a new series that we are uh, simply calling The Exodus. Uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Exodus and the story of Israel's uh, miraculous exodus from Egyptian occupation. Um, it's a story that many of us are familiar with. Um, I think it is uh, fascinates us, but I think it's a story that we uh, often struggle to relate with and see ourselves in the gospel in. Uh, I think it's a story that we, uh, more often than not, relate with Charleston Heston, more so than we do the faithfulness of God in our own lives. So over the next month or two, we are going to spend some time looking at the story of the Exodus and seeing the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the righteousness of God, the judgment of God, and the graciousness of the gospel. The deliverance of God's people in the book of Exodus is a lens into the deliverance uh, and graciousness and goodness that we have received through Jesus in his sacrifice on our behalf. So I'm excited about what God has in store for us, and I'm excited uh, for God to bring this story to life and reveal himself to us. But for today, we begin at the beginning of the story, and we begin with the one person who is present at the beginning of all of our stories. That one person who is the rock of so many of our lives and our families. So today, we are going to spend this Mother, Mother's Day looking at one of the most amazing mothers in the Bible. It's a mom with a funny name that you might not know a lot about, but it's a mom whose faith uh, is going to challenge us all and call us a deeper faith no matter our current role, circumstances, or challenges. Uh, so today we are going to be introduced to Moses' mom, Jochebed, and it is her incredible faith that will not only save Moses' life, but set the foundation for his belief system and calling. But as we begin today and we celebrate Mother's Day, I do want to pause real quickly and acknowledge the difficulty that this day can bring for many. I know for many, Mother's Day, is, Mother's Day is one of the most difficult days of the year to show up at church because of the hurt that can come alongside it. Uh, some lost their mothers recently or at a young age. Uh, for others, your mom wasn't a wonderful influence. For others, you long to be a mom, but for whatever reason, it hasn't happened. Uh, for some, you have a child that's gone astray or you lost a child in the womb or, or in childhood, and there is hurt with, the, with this day. So whatever the reason, if you fall in that camp, we just want to say thank you for coming, and it is our prayer that you will be encouraged today and you will be reminded of God's faithfulness and love for you. Because Jochebed's story isn't just a story of motherhood, but it's a story of faith in God in the midst of incredible trial. It's a story of God's provision and the story of God's trustworthiness. So my prayer for all of us is that, that, as, that as we leave today, we leave reminded of God's faithfulness, emboldened in our faith, reminded of his love and goodness. So with that, we're going to read Jochebed's story. We're going to primarily be in Exodus chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 10, if you'd like to head that direction. But the first verse I want to read for us today is Numbers 26, 59, and that's where we hear of Jochebed's name. It reads, the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, a descendant of Levi who was born to the Levites in Egypt. To Amram she bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam. Now, Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It reads, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. She placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, Moses' sister Miriam, asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. 
She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Then real quickly, I want to jump to Acts chapter 7, which gives us more insight into Jochebed's faith. It says, as the time drew near, starting in verse 17, as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king, to whom Joseph knew meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own. Moses was educated in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Then lastly, Hebrews 11, uh, uh, verse 23, gives us more insight. 1 through 2 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then verse 23, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you uh, for the faith of Jochebed and the example that we have uh, through her life of what it looks like to follow you in difficult circumstances. Yeah, we thank you for the faith of Jochebed that, that, that saved and protected Moses' life, but then let him go to fulfill his calling uh, that you had put on his life. So God, I just pray that as we study this passage of Scripture, Lord, that we would, first, we would give thanks for your faithfulness in our lives and, and the faithfulness of so many around us. God, and then I pray that you would call us and draw us into deeper faith in you, trusting you no matter what is going on in our life and no matter what our circumstances are. Because God, we thank you that you are good and that you are trustworthy. God, we love you and we praise you. and It's your name we pray. Amen. So that was, a, that was a lot of Jochebed's story, and I'm going to give you a little bit more, because if you turn back to Exodus chapter 1 and the tail end of the book of Genesis, that's where we get the context for why the Israelites are in uh, the nation of Egypt. The book of Genesis ends with the story of Joseph. And Joseph is one of the most incredible stories in the Bible. It's a story that we recently looked at in youth group, and we studied as a church back in 2018. But in that story, Joseph is sold off to Egyptian slavery by his jealous brothers. There he faces a series of incredible ups and downs, but the one thing remains consistent. And the one thing consistent through that story is God's presence in Joseph's life. Terrible things happen to Joseph, but over and over we are reminded that God was with him. And so over time we see God's plan for Joseph's life unfold. He's eventually elevated to uh, second in command of the nation of Egypt. And he's given the job, the responsibility to store and feed the people of Egypt in the midst of a great seven-year famine. During that time, his brothers and eventually dad and all of his family come and they bow before him and they ask for food. Through that, he forgives them and reveals to them that what they meant for harm, God had used for good. Anyway, that story unfolds, and his whole family moves with him to Egypt, and they become the nation of Israel. There were 12 brothers, and they become the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And so that's why the nation, that's why the Hebrews, the, the Israelites, are in Egypt when we pick up in Exodus chapter 1. Verse 6 of Exodus 1 says, Now Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly. They increased in number, and they became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, a new pharaoh, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become far too num numerous. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. So the Israelites come to Egypt as free men. They come and really save the nation through Joseph. But the generations pass, a new pharaoh takes over, and he knows nothing of Joseph. And he sees this rapidly multiplying people as a threat. He and his advisors say to the, that the Hebrews are becoming too numerous, and he fears an uprising, so he makes them slaves. Chapter 1 continues, and the, the ramifications become stronger and stronger as this threat grows in the Pharaoh's head. By the end of chapter 1, Pharaoh gives this order. He says, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. So the Pharaoh's solution to this rapidly growing threat is to just nip this in the bud and stop their ability to reproduce as people. The women can live because they can serve us and they can, uh, we can slowly make them our own, but so let's kill off the baby boys by throwing them into the Nile. 
What a, it's just a sickening solution when you think of it. I think we read this and we read so many stories in the Bible and we just say, oh, you know, that's okay. It's just a story in the Bible. But you, can you imagine what this decree would have looked and felt and sounded like? Can you imagine seeing babies thrown into the river? Can you imagine the horror of that? Imagine that happening in our, our very own river that flows through town. The wails of terror that would be heard over and over. I mean, this is an evil, awful decree. And as we will see, this is how the Egyptians often governed and lived. They had no respect for life and for respect for God. And I point that out because it provides a foundation for who the Egyptians were as we study this book of the Exodus. But I also point it out to reveal the world in which Jochebed lived. Our world is messed up at times and we mourn for it. But I think sometimes we make the excuse that our world is too messed up and so it is impossible for me to live out my faith and follow God in the midst of it. We say it's just too much. But I don't say this lightly, but, I, but if you think our culture is messed up and too far gone, it pales in comparison to the Egyptian culture that was enslaving and abusing the Israelite people. Jochebed lives in a world where her husband is a slave, and the law says her baby boy and all other baby boys must be thrown into the Nile to drown or be eaten by the beast of the Nile. And yet in the midst of this culture of evil and depravity, we're going to see two incredible things. First, we are going to see that God is still on his throne, he is still in control, and he is still working. And secondly, we are going to see that a person can still live out their faith in a culture of opposition. Those are two things we need to cling to today. With all that is going on, I can still trust that God is in control and he is still moving and saving. And secondly, I see in Jacob's life that despite my culture and my struggles, I can still have faith. God is sovereign and on the move in all cultures, no matter the pushback. And so that's the world that Jochebed and Amram live in. You know, you think about this world and you can almost imagine the dread and fear that entered their lives when they recognized the signs that she was with child. At the time, they had a daughter, Miriam, and a son, Aaron, but it was a different world now. A baby boy would mean tragedy in their home. You can only imagine the prayers for those seven, eight, nine months that would have been lifted up to God to protect their baby. Prayers for a baby girl. And then the disappointment when she was handed a baby boy. At first, it would have seemed as though God hadn't heard their prayers. It would have been a crushing blow, but Jochebed wasn't going to let her son be thrown into the Nile without a fight. And so our first point is this. By faith, Jochebed protects her child. In Hebrews 11, although unnamed, Jochebed makes the, the hall of faith. It says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Amram and Jochebed recognized that this baby was a gift from God and they set out to obey God, to value this baby's life and to ignore the Pharaoh's edict. Something we see here is that when the, the laws of those governing you go against God's laws, it's always right to follow God, even if it means hardship for you and your family. Please note, I say, when those governing God goes against God's laws, not your preferences or political beliefs, but against God's laws, it's always right to stand up. Paul and Jesus are clear that when the law violates our preferences, our call is to submit. But when it violates God's laws, we stand firm. The murdering of babies is without question a violation of God's laws. So Amram and Jochebed risked their lives to try to save their baby boy. But there was great risk involved. For Moses' parents, it could have meant personal harm, financial insecurity, or death. But they set out to obey and protect this young boy. And so for three months, they do everything they can to keep the baby quiet, to keep him hidden and out of sight from the Egyptian police or guards, protecting, providing, and praying for their baby, trusting that God was somehow going to protect him. Every shriek, every laugh, every wail would have been terrifying as they tried to hush Moses, but they convinced God's ways were better than Pharaoh's. And so the fate of her son is, is out of her control, and so she turns him over and trust Moses to God. As you think about your life, what is it that you have uh, right now that has you overwhelmed, that, that seems impossible, that God is calling you to trust him with? For some of you, it may be a child. It may be our world. For others, it may be a physical problem, a family problem, or something entirely different. 
But what is it that God is calling you to trust him that just seems like too much? First, have you, through prayer and petition, given that to God? We see in Jochebed's life that God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we desire him to. The easy and prayed for solution would have been a baby girl, but God is faithful and his ways and plans are better than our own. And so Jochebed puts her faith in God, trusting him and obeying what she knows to be right in the eyes of the Lord. She obeys God and protects her child. Some of us may need to just remember and hear that today, that we need to obey and trust God in the midst of trial. We have a response, as parents, we have a responsibility to protect our children when they're in our care and trust God with them when we can't, which brings us to our next point. So she protects Moses, but then by faith, Jochebed releases Moses. She releases him into the Nile. Notice that she doesn't just like willy-nilly set Moses outside in a basket, but through what I imagine is constant prayer, she does all she can to plan, provide protection, and then she lets him go. This part of the Nile River was known for, uh, for their bees, for crocodiles. It was not an ideal home for a baby, and so she makes this basket to protect him from the beasts of the river and the heat of the sun. The boat would have been modeled after an Egyptian riverboat, papyrus made waterproof with tar and pitch. The Hebrew word here used for basket is, 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 the Old Test, is only used one other time in the Old Testament. It's the word translated ark. And so once again, God will protect his people and preserve the Hebrew line through an ark. But we see here that Jochebed's faith is not a passive faith, but an active, play, active faith. She plans, she prote- prepares, and she does all she can to protect Moses. But then she lets him go into the river and trust God with his life. That letting go is not easy. Pastor Mark Bertrand brought this story to life for me with these questions for Jochebed. He said, what were you thinking, Jochebed? Did you weep as you wove the little basket? Did you pray as you covered the little ark with tar? Did the other children pry you with questions? Did you tell them the story of Noah and the ark and how God used it to save his life? Jochebed, did your faith waver? Did you feel hollow from hopelessness? Did you feel weak and powerless? Did you dare to sing to your baby as you wove that little ark? Did you brush his cheek one last time and kiss his little forehead before you closed the lid? Did you dare to hope that that the God you depended on had some sort of plan? Did you dare to hope that your child would see see another day? Or was it all you could do to just pray? As parents, we care deeply about our kids. We want to protect them and we want to keep them safe. We want to control all we can about their world so that they never experience pain. But the reality of our world is it is a sinful, fallen world, and at some point, our children will experience it. And for some, it will come sooner than others. For young Moses, that reality hit at three months old. But nothing is out of God's control. The best thing we can do as parents, as grandparents for our children, is to do the best with what we have and then trust them to God. Trusting that God cares about our children and our grandchildren and our neighbors and our nieces and nephews even more than we do. And so Jochebed releases the baby boy into the reeds, into the marshes of the Nile River. And there in the midst of the tall reeds, Pharaoh's daughter has just so happened to come to the mighty and powerful Nile. She's come to bathe, likely bathing in the river for its perceived medical and religious powers. And so here she is, the daughter of Pharaoh, following a pagan religious practice. And she hears the cry of a baby, perhaps sees the glimmer of the sunlight off the basket. She sends a servant over to retrieve it. Verse 6, as she opens the basket and she feels compassion or feels sorry for the baby. And she recognizes it's one of the Hebrew babies. She knew the edict her dad had declared. She knew what was supposed to happen to this little boy, but it says she felt compassion. And it just so happens at this time, Sister Miriam enters the scene. She'd been off to the side watching her over her brother, and she comes and says to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to go find a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby? In this era, in this time, you couldn't just go buy formula for a three-month-old. But because of the edict, there would have been undoubtedly multiple Hebrew women who could have filled the role. In the life of the Moses, the life of Moses, the exodus, the fate of the Hebrew people waits on the response of Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter says, go and get a Hebrew woman. And the thing we're going to see in this is is maybe the most incredible thing in this story, and that is that God 
provides in abundance. Jochebed lets Moses go, and God provides in abundance. As Jochebed released her son to the Nile, she didn't know what the future held. She didn't know if he would live or if she would ever see her baby again. I'm sure she prayed for safety, for protection, and for life for her son. But God's plans were greater than she could have ever imagined. I can only imagine the fear she must have felt as she saw her daughter Miriam run to her from the Nile. The trepidation she must have felt about going before Pharaoh's daughter. And then the exaltation as Pharaoh's daughter gave her son back to her to nurse and care for. And then on top of that, we see the abundance as she is paid to care for her own child. How Jochebed must have cherished those days she had with the young Moses. And for Moses, how formative those days must have been. God doesn't just provide for the safety of Moses, but God reconnects him with his own mom who is able to nurture him, love him, and tell him in his foundational years about the one true God and who he is in him. God uses these formative years to lay the foundation for the exodus. Scholars debate about how long this period must have, would have been, but most say three to four years, and some stretch it as long as seven years. Regardless, Jochebed was able to influence young Moses in his most formative years. You can only imagine the countless stories of God she must have whispered in his ears. Dreams of the promised land. Dreams of a promised deliverer and perhaps even whispered that one day he might be that deliverer. I don't know, but it's certain he was given a godly foundation that would stay with him the rest of his life. And this is so incredible, and I hate to... I don't know, nerd out on you here, but research tells us that by five to six years old, a child's brain is, is 90% formed. UNICEF and World Bank have recently teamed up to just pour uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars into programs for kids in developing nations in this age range. They are doing this because more and more data is supporting that the first thousand days of a child's life are the most important developmentally, that the brain develops exponentially during those first five years. They are pouring money into these programs because they determine what God already knew. And that is that what happens to a child from birth to three is the biggest indicator of future success and impact. And God just so happened to give Moses back to his mom. That's why I genuinely believe that what happens downstairs in our nursery, in our children's classroom, is just as, if not more important than what we do up here on a Sunday morning. That's why we prioritize teaching your children about God and the gospel. As young children, they are a sponge for truth, and we want to provide and help you provide a biblical foundation for them. That's why it's so important for you as parents to love your children and to share the Bible with them at home. If there's ever anything we can do to help you with that, please let us know. It's our desire to do that. Your children are the future. We want to invest in them, love them, and point them to Jesus. If we want to see a generation of godly leaders change our world, it starts in the cradle. That's what we see with Moses. And so if you're here and you're a mom or a dad, be encouraged that what you do matters. Invest in your children. Love your children. Be present in their lives and point them to Jesus. If you're here today and you're no longer in the parent phase or you're not yet in the parent phase, find a way to invest in the next generation by serving with kids on Sunday mornings or on Wednesday nights or at VBS. Or if you're not a kid person, that's all right. But find a way to support those who do by, by helping uh, organize and clean classrooms, provide supplies, welcoming new families, maybe showing up at someone's house with a diaper, a grocery card, or a meal for an overwhelmed parent. Whatever phase you're in, find a way to invest in the next generation and point them to Jesus. So God gives Moses back to Jochebed. And after a few years, the day comes that Jochebed has been dreading ever since Moses returned to home. It's a day when she will have to send him to the home of Pharaoh's daughter. And she's going to once again have to trust God in the midst of a huge trial. She is sending her son away, maybe to never be seen again. She's sending him into the home of a man who enslaves and kills her own people. She is sending him into a corrupted, broken, and fallen world. It has been said that parenting is just a long process of letting go. In every phase, we are parenting, teaching, preparing our children for the next step, only to let them go. As parents, our ultimate goal is not to raise prosperous children, but our goal is to raise functioning adults that are on mission for God. Our goal is to raise children that will one day go 
Dr. Jeff Orridge wrote, Parents, your goal is not protecting your children from risk and pain at all costs. Your goal must be emotionally healthy, spiritually growing, socially functional adults. And to get there, you must push your children to take risk, experience failure, handle their own conflicts, and feel some pain. Parenting is hard, and it's having the faith to let go. I know for us, we have cried every time we've let go. We've cried when we sent our children to, uh, on to the next phase of life. We've cried on the first day of preschool. We've cried on the first day of kindergarten. And I can't imagine what Jochebed must have felt. Sending Moses to the palace after having that gift for the first few years. I think in some ways it almost feels like letting him go in the Nile might have been easier. When she let him go into the Nile, she was backed into a corner. There was no other option. But things feel safer at home this go around. But yet she still has to let him go. And by letting him go, she is going to get to see God work in a way she never could have if she had held on to him. So point four is this. By faith, Jochebed releases Moses or her child into the world. Fortunately for most of us, we will never face a trial like Jochebed, but letting our go of our children is one of the hardest things we have to do as parents. Whether it be letting go of the bike that first time or kindergarten or their first sleepover or camp or prom or college or getting married, parenting is constantly letting go, only to let them come back and let go again. Mark Mitchell in his sermon on this passage says, there are things mothers can do, but ultimately they have to leave it in God's hands. That's the hardest part, isn't it? A mother's love never changes, but parenthood is a constant process of letting go. Letting your child make mistakes. Letting your teenager learn some things the hard way. Letting your adult child follow God's call, even if it means they live a thousand miles away. Mothers, take heart, he says. God will use your courageous, sensible faith to accomplish his purposes. He's working behind the scenes to accomplish his purpose in your children's life. He will use you, but it's not all up to you. So Jochebed lets Moses go, trusting God. I imagine she prayed for him constantly, hoping and trusting she had prepared him and instilled the values of God in him the best she could during those treasured years. We don't know if they would ever meet again. We don't know if their paths would ever cross, but we do know that Jochebed's influence was forever felt in Moses' life. So if you're here and you're a mom, a dad, a grandparent, aunt, uncle, mentor, if you have a child that's a young adult that has grown up and has moved on, They're not under your roof daily. Don't forsake to pray for them. Although they may no longer be under your roof, you can pray and trust them to God. And so with a Hebrew foundation, Moses heads to the palace to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter and the grandchild of the Pharaoh, the man that in order he be killed. That's a pretty amazing story if we stop right there. But it continues. Acts 7, we read it earlier, says Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. And the final thing we see in Moses' story is that God prepares for his call. We're going to continue to see this point next week, but look at God's hand in this entire story. Moses is given the first few years to get the foundation from his mom, but then he is schooled by the best scholars in Egyptian culture. He learns the Egyptian language. He learns Egyptian law. He learns Egyptian military tactics, etiquette, and he has a relationship with the Pharaoh. This is so amazing because it is this secular training that is preparing him to lead a couple million people out of Egypt. It's this secular training that is preparing him to record the history of his people in the first five books of the Bible. It's this secular training that is, and his study of Egyptian law that is preparing him to write his own nation's law some 70 years later. God is preparing him for his call. Some commentators argue for different queens and princesses at the mom. And with that, within that, some even argue that he was groomed to be the next pharaoh. But it doesn't really matter. What we see is that, that he is given the best uh, of everything possible in his world. And although Moses may not have known, and the Egyptians certainly didn't know, Moses was being prepared for what God ultimately had in store for him. God cared about Moses, but he also cared about the people of Israel. And Jochebed's faithful obedience and trust in God is making a way for all of Israel to be saved. Think about this. What, think about if, if Jochebed, uh, if she would not have trusted God. Think about if she would have just selfishly held on to Moses, trusting her own strength over God's. Think about if she wouldn't have had the courage to rescue Moses and would have just given in to the order. God is sovereign. He would have found another way to save his people. But what a journey Jochebed would have missed out on. 
But what we see in that is that when we trust God, we get to be a part of God's plans and we get to see God do great things. We see that played out in our, in our life, in our, in our call to, to share Jesus with our friends, family, and neighbors. That invitation to share Jesus is an invitation to be a part of God's rescue story. It's an invitation to see lives change for eternity. God's going to save with or without us. But like Jochebed, he has invited us to be a part of that journey. What a life-giving, life-fulfilling journey it is. Jochebed chooses to be faithful, and she gets to be a part of an incredible story. So although Moses, although giving Moses back to Pharaoh's daughter must have been gut-wrenching for Jochebed, we see that God was still in control, and his plans for her son were greater than she could have ever dreamed. God had made Pharaoh's daughter, uh, God could have made Pharaoh's daughter forget about the Hebrew boy in those years. He could have, she could have passed away during those years. She could, have, uh, she could have passed away and left Moses to be with her parents. But had that happened, Moses wouldn't have received the preparation and training he needed for the exodus. So I'm sure it was difficult for Jochebed, and, and she may have felt like her prayers weren't answered. But we see that God was absolutely at work. And there are so many times in our lives where we feel like God isn't answering our prayers. But we can trust that he is at work. We can trust that he is on his throne. And we can trust that he is working things for his glory. Jochebed may have never seen her son again. She likely wouldn't have been a part of the exodus. She would have never seen the promised land or the Red Sea part. But God had that all in mind all along. And so although God didn't answer her prayer of a girl or an edict change or that Moses would somehow stay in her house forever, God was at work, he was protecting Moses, and he provided for him, and he rescued his people. So although God may not answer your prayer the way you desire or as quickly as you desire, you can trust that God is providing for you and your family as well. In Mitchell's summary of the story, he writes, Surely you see God's hand in all of this. The mother did what she could, but she couldn't have done it all on her own. Pharaoh's chosen instrument of death, the Nile River, became the instrument through which Moses was saved. His mother even followed Pharaoh's order by placing him in the Nile. A member of Pharaoh's own family came to the river at just the right time and rescued the future deliverer. The baby was reunited with his mom, who was able to raise the child during his most formative years, teaching about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jacob had released him to Pharaoh's daughter, where he learned law, rhetoric, mathematics, hieroglyphics, and the art of war. And then Moses led two million people through a desert, putting all of those disciplines to work. God is sovereign and in control of Jochebed's family. And he is sovereign and in control over the nations. His plans are greater than ours. He cares personally for Jochebed and his people. And God makes a way for his people to be saved. So what, uh, what is some possible application of this story that's now thousands of years old? How could this story possibly be relevant to our lives today? Well, I think there's a lot of ways it's applicable in our lives today. For some of us, we need to be reminded of what I just mentioned, and that is that God is sovereign. He is in control, and he is bigger than our fears and bigger than our world and our culture. Jochebed faced extreme cultural opposition, and Moses faced death at the hands of the Egyptian culture. There seemed to be no hope. I'm sure fear overwhelmed their home. And yet despite that, Despite the way things it looked, God was still in control. He still cared for his people, and he was a faithful and loving God. And so for you, when you face opposition, when you are fearful, you can trust that God is still sovereign. He is still in control. He is still faithful, and he still loves you and your family. Although it may feel as though things are unraveling in our world, nation, and culture, you can trust that God is still in control. Daniel 2.21 says, He, God, changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Romans 13.1 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. The Bible is clear that God is sovereign over the nations. He is sovereign over leaders, and He places both the good and the bad to accomplish His purposes. In Romans, it tells us that God placed the Pharaoh in place so that he might display his power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. God is bigger. He is sovereign over and control, in control of and accomplishing his purposes in our nation, in our politics, in our culture, so we can put our faith in him and trust him in the midst of it all. So that's you, and that's something that scares you and gives you fear. Turn them over to him and place your faith in him 
in the midst of our world. Within this story, we see the, the value and importance of passing on a legacy of faith and godliness within our families. Jacob's time with Moses was limited to probably three to four years, but that legacy was lasting. If you're a parent or a grandparent, use the years, months, days you have with your children and grandchildren and others to, uh, that God has given you to, to bring life, to invest in them, not just in their education, but also in their, their spiritual formation and their personhood. Treasure those times and invest in them. God can and will use those moments to make a lasting impact in their life. Intentionally invest and then through persistent prayer, release them to God's purposes for their lives. Pray also for that right time to let go. Obey when God says, God says let go, even if not when you want. God can use their lives in ways we can only imagine when we trust them to him. So invest, and then when the time comes, let them go and trust them to God to use them in ways that simply aren't possible under your roof. Moses couldn't have led the Israelites out of captivity if he had never left Jochebed's home. But because of the unique circumstance of his childhood, he was prepared to lead the nation out of captivity and record the history of God's people. The application is endless, I think, but Melinda, she's going to come to play, and as she comes, I'm going to share with you a final application and fulfillment of this story. It's possible you are here and it feels like your life is falling apart. It lacks purpose and you have nowhere to turn. If that is you, please know that God sees you, he cares for you, and he loves you. In fact, the New Testament tells us of a deliverer, a savior that was much greater than Moses. Jesus came not to save a nation, but he came to save the world. And he came to save anyone who would put their faith in him. He came to earth and died on a cross paying the penalty that your sins and my sin deserves because he cares for you and he loves you. John 3, 16 through 7, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Because God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Because of God's love for you, he sent Jesus to die in your place. And if you believe in him, you will inherit eternal life, the Bible says. He comes not to condemn you, but to give you hope to give you a purpose that you can experience peace and love that surpasses all understanding. So if you're here and you have never put your faith in Jesus or even looked into who he is, I would encourage you to do that today. We believe that he is the hope of the world and we believe that he is the hope for your life and situation. But you must submit and follow him. So what is God calling you to today? Maybe it's the situation in your life. Maybe it's a, a trial. Maybe it's a circumstance. Maybe it's just the, the trial of our day. Would you trust him with that? Would you turn it over and release it to him? Would you trust your family, your children, your grandchildren to him? Would you have faith that he is a God who is sovereign in control? Maybe he's calling you to, to follow him or to follow his call. Maybe he's calling you to invest in children or your own children or children at church. Maybe he's calling you to invest in church and, and to commit. Maybe he's calling you to invest in your God and not see it just as in your job, but not see it just as a work, but as a place to shine his light and share the gospel. What is he calling you to do? Would you have faith and trust him in it? Maybe you're here and God is calling you to trust him with the ultimate rescue in your life. He's calling you to find your hope, your future, your salvation, your eternity in him. If that's you, would you have the courage to trust him today or to talk to someone and ask what it means to follow him? I'm going to pray for us, and when I pray for us, after I, after I pray for us, Melinda's going to play, and if she plays, I'd ask you just to bow your head and just spend a, a couple moments reflecting on this passage and who God is and what he's calling you to. And I'll come and close us in prayer, and, and we will dismiss. So, Lord, we just thank you um, for who you are. We thank you for your character that we see revealed in this story uh, of Jochebed and Moses. God, we thank you for her example of, of faithfulness and courage. God, we thank you that when she put her faith in you, you were faithful to come through. You were trustworthy. So God, I pray that as we uh, just spend a few moments reflecting, that you would reveal those areas in our lives where we need to trust you, where we need to have faithfulness in you. God, we know that as we release those things, that you will be good, and that you will be faithful and that you will provide in abundance as we need. So God, I just pray that you would uh, just open our hearts and minds to what you have for us in these next couple of moments. And God, and that you would give us the courage and faith to trust you. God, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.